Previously, we explored Sega's first take in an attempt to create the first 3D Sonic game called Sonic Mars on the Sega Genesis add-on, the 32X. This was being handled by the American branch, the Sega Technical Institute, or STI for short, who had also made Sonic the Hedgehog 2, 3, and Knuckles. But shortly after, its Japanese staff had left and formed the Sonic team back in Japan to make games including Nights Into Dreams at that very moment. As a result, remaining staff developed a long document for a story that was to incorporate the Saturday morning Sonic cartoon characters along with coming up with several takes on how Sonic should even function 3D. Whether it be in an isometric camera angle, or even one where it would play more like Doom or Crash Bandicoot. Ultimately, coming to a more freeform gameplay and open levels. However, the technical limitations of the 32X proved to make development a challenge, and faced repeated scrutiny from major staff at Sega, including Sonic co-creator Yuji Naka, who simply said good luck. This along with the inability for staff to get along and make real progress on development, thus leading the game to finally be pushed by Sega to their upcoming next generation console, the Sega Saturn. But this became an opportunity for the team now led by Chris Sen to start over and with a machine that could give them the horsepower they needed. A game called Sonic Extreme. But even then, development wasn't going to be so rosy as numerous indecisions, overcomplications of changing engines, and staff politics would prove, let alone someone even almost dying during the process. And so today on Gaming History, we shall look at the disastrous history of Sonic Extreme. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the subscribe button and hit the like button too, to further support us and keep creating new videos. Sonic Extreme's development officially began in winter 1995. As development was about to begin, the lead programmer, Don Goddard, quit Sega as he was told that all his work would go to waste in the transition between the 32X and the Saturn since he'd have to start over. With Goddard gone now, this left a major hole at STI as the lead programmer was now gone while the Saturn's more complex architecture was looming, thus leaving the chair empty and leaving only major programmers Ofer Allon and Christina Coffin available. As a result, Mike Wallace, who had taken over as the producer at the end of Sonic Mars development, arranged for two teams to be made. A main team that would make the actual levels, composed of both Ofer Allon and Chris Sen, who would serve as the lead designer, but also the only person Ofer Allon would ever get along with. The other team was in charge of making boss levels. This section was led by Christina Coffin. While Alan and Coffin had been at each other's throats on the previous project, here they were able to work independently of one another. While the two teams were made to handle different sections of the game, they strangely enough decided to both use different game engines. Coffin continued to use the engine she had been using since the Sonic Mars days, while Alan was developing a new one. Quickly enough, 3D environments were being made, with several zones in the works, featuring levels that were non-linear and featured many curves and turns, a lot like the sandbox approach that Super Mario 64 was taking with its levels. But that was as far as ideas were getting, as the idea of how to control Sonic was still a mystery. Being Sonic's first outing in 3D, they had to make a proper transition of keeping his speed while in a 3D space, and by running as fast as he does, it could make seeing upcoming obstacles a real challenge. But Ophiralon came up with a solution, the utilization of a reflex lens. This would give the game a fisheye perspective, whereby it would curve the screen towards the center, but also allow one to see more of the world on all sides. This as such would allow one to see the upcoming obstacles while going at Sonic's top speed. At long last, Sonic finally was able to function in 3D space with reasonable results. The levels that were being made included the simple test level, made of various cubes and platforms to test Sonic on. But otherwise, the main levels included Jade Gully, this game's own version of Green Hill Zone, which took place in a lush green watery scape with the titular brown cubes everywhere. An ice level called Crystal Frost with its slippery platforming, a fiery cave level called Red Sand, and early development on various other levels including an underwater one called Blue Ocean, an Egypt based level, and even a Christmas themed one that even has Art of Sonic in Christmas garbs but biggest of all being Galaxy Fortress, aka the Death Egg, 
revived from Sonic 3 and Knuckles, bigger and grander than ever, with many, many sections. While the main stages were all well underway, Christina Coffin was hard at work on her side with the boss levels. At this point, she had scrapped any last remains of the old Sonic Mars engine and made a new engine for this one. This one would not include the reflex lens, as it was more of a battle than a test of speed. She took inspiration from various other Sega games she had played in the past, such as Gunstar Heroes, to make the game's numerous bosses. This leading to the return of Mecha Sonic a callback to STI's days on Sonic the Hedgehog 2. At first they had many concepts on redesigning him in wild and wacky manners, including a red version even. Other bosses included Fang the Sniper, a new character based on a weasel who would use a gun, a first for a series, and would later on be properly introduced as a character to the series by Sonic the Fighter. This along with a boss called Gemstone which according to Christina Coffin, was simply just a test boss, as it was simply a gemstone that stood in the middle, menacingly. Plans also existed for other bosses that hadn't been made yet, including a robot cat called Emerald Cat, another boss called Flame Falcon, which was a bug-like enemy that would transform into a flaming falcon mid-battle. This monstrosity called Mechamite. One called Guardian Sphinx, which likely was for the Egypt level, along with a football player shaped one and an octopod, which appeared to be robotic controlled bosses, as well as one boss that didn't even get a design called Dark Pool Gorilla. And lastly, an evil Sonic that was actually programmed in, but nothing of that boss was ever seen by the public. Potentially an early idea that eventually may have led to the creation of Shadow the Hedgehog. At this point, the character of Sonic had been rendered with 2D sprites that were digitized from a 3D model, much as how Donkey Kong Country had prior. However, Coffin wanted her Sonic in those boss fights to be in full 3D instead, and so utilizing the assistance of Kunitake Aoki, an artist at Sega, who was at the time working hard on the game Die Hard Arcade, took Coffin's request and made it a reality. While development continued on, Game Story was one that was changing constantly since the days of Sonic Mars, and one aspect of the old story that was carried over was Sonic's new love interest, Tiara Bubowski. The story this time would start with Sonic having just rescued Tiara Bubowski from Dr. Robotnik, but then gets infected with a doom virus that Dr. Robotnik had laced Tiara's chains with, this leading Sonic to meet Tiara's father, Professor Bubowski, for a cure in the land of of Mobius, the same name as the computer land from the Mars build, where he is told that he has to go to various worlds in order to get the proper ingredients to make a cure. But little does Sonic know that the professor is actually Robotnik in disguise who wishes to use the ingredients to make a cure for himself instead, as he is also afflicted by the virus. And this was the story that development started on, and so characters including Tiara Bubowski were made playable alongside Sonic, which her levels were being made as 2D playable sections in contrast to Sonic's own 3D ones. Along with those two were Tails and Knuckles that were also being designed as playable too. Knuckles stages in contrast to the other two were being made as top-down maze-like levels. Tails however isn't known what his playstyle would have been like, and may not even have gotten that far into development to make that a reality even. With some confidence in Sega of America, they were now pushing the marketing of this game hard, and stress was starting to build on the team as they and virtually any Sonic fan was looking forward to seeing it in action at the upcoming E3 1996 event in May. Sega of Japan was also now paying close attention to the game as it was becoming the Sega Saturn's killer app. As a result, new members joined from the Japanese side, including veteran Sonic designer Hirokazu Yasuhara and officially now artist Kunitake Aoki. This was the first time since Sonic 3 & Knuckles that the Japanese staff had returned to STI, and for them to get along better this time, management even awarded the developers with promotional Sonic Extreme pins. Hirokazu Yasuhara, who had designed many of the 2D Sonic stages, designed numerous 3D stages and acts to be used with an Alon's engine. 
But the problem was that Yasuhara's levels were designed with a fully 3D map in mind, which Alon's engine wasn't designed around that, and were more restricted 3D maps. As such, despite all of Yasuhara's hard work designing all these stages, they never were attempted. But with pressure building on the teams, both Ofer Alon and Christina Coffin were very overworked, putting in numerous hours to get their sections of the game working. Ofer Alon section of the main game had already come along a great deal, now even featuring the ability to rotate the whole world around Sonic, even going as far as to imitate some of 2D Sonic's linear high speed paths by featuring such sections in 3D as well. In fact, Alon had been foolproofing the engine so much that it was being made with the intention of being used for future projects as well, a potential Sonic Extreme 2 in fact, a dream ready to be shattered. While the game had come along fast within only a few months, now being in early 1996, it still had some serious frame rate problems, making it unplayable in some sections. Despite it still being early in development, management at STI was looking for a way to fix this issue and making sure the game is actually completed. As such, Robert Morgan, the technical director of STI, decided that they would use an outside company called Point of View for this endeavor, a company that Robert Morgan himself had co-founded, this all being done without actually the development team knowing. As a result, one day, both Ofer Alon and Chris Sen were brought in and told about this plan, shown a demonstration which Chris Sen noted that they showed us a sonic sprite we were already using floating in the upper right of the screen, a checkerboard ground, a rotating shaded polygonal shape floating in the air, and maybe a ring sprite animating. This effectively was going to demote Alon from technical lead to a regular programmer and be replaced with Robert Morgan himself with point of view taking Alon's engine into their hands. As the Sega of America rep was going on about the demo to them saying we're on a mission, Alon abruptly got up and said have a nice trip, and walked out. Alon was deeply insulted after all the time he had spent on building this engine, just to have it stripped from his control. Much of this can be attributed to when Alon was hired during Sonic Mars development, as he was pinned as a programming genius with a high price tag. As such, expectations were way too high of him. It also didn't help that he wasn't in the eyes of management so much, as he chose to work in isolation in his office. With how insulted Alon and Chris Sen were, they both continued to simply work from home, but also began working privately on a PC version of Sonic Extreme alongside the Saturn version now being done by a point of view and Christina Coffin, however. It was now March 1996, and Sega of Japan was ready to see how progress was going with this game. As a result, executive Shochiro Irimajiri paid a visit to them. For the presentation, both the main engine made by Ofer Alon, now in the hands of Point of View, were to be shown alongside Coffin's boss engine. However, Irimajiri was accidentally presented with two versions of the main engine, one being a modern, cleaner one by point of view, the second was an earlier version of Alon's engine that ran at a very horrible frame rate. Despite that not being the latest version, Irimajiri was disappointed with how much he thought was left to be done. In contrast, he loved Christina Coffin's engine with how well it ran it and at a stable frame rate. As a result, he requested the whole game now be remade solely on Coffin's engine. Basically, Point of View was out of the job as quickly as they got it. Meanwhile, Ofer Alan and Chris Sen were ready to present their PC version of the game at that same meeting, but because of the disappointment from earlier, they decide to hold off this time. At this point, producer Mike Wallace was done with all the politics around this game, and in order to get this game delivered and done on time, he demanded from management at Sega of America and STI to give him access to all the tools he needed and a dedicated team. As such, he got a team of 4 artists, 2 programmers, and 3 designers. With the game hitting a reboot once more, it was decided that the story needed to be refreshed. As such, associate producer Rick Wheeler and designer Hirokazu Yasuhara worked on a new story for this game, one that was much more in line with the already existing Sonic story of the previous 2D Sonic games. The story would take place directly after Sonic 3 and Knuckles, whereby Dr. Robotnik had rebuilt his Death Egg Fortress from that game, bigger and badder than ever. So big that it was larger than the planet, leading to planets leaving their orbit and instead orbiting the Death Egg. And thus Robotnik's new plan was to conquer Earth by taking it 
it in this manner. With the planet already being drawn towards it, Sonic, utilizing a teleporter made by Tails, would travel to the planet-sized Death Egg to try and destroy it before it was too late. Except he hits one of the other planets in its orbit. A strange planet filled with badniks under Robotnik's control. A trap Robotnik had planned here. And so it now became Sonic's mission to free the planet and find a way to the new Death Egg and destroy it. While it is unknown at this point what Tiara Bubowski's fate was, it can be safely assumed that she was now officially gone and in her place came Sonic City's heroine Amy Rose as Sonic's main love interest. Likely another means to tie it to the previous games which led to the Mecha Sonic boss battle becoming Metal Sonic instead to also further tie back to Sonic CD. And so Coffin's engine, named Project Condor, was the central focus of the project and given the hard deadline of Christmas 1996, only a little over half a year away for a game that had basically hit the reset button. But Coffin was dedicated to meeting that deadline, working all her waking hours and isolating herself to program, going as far as to even find ways to cut down on optimization by even requiring the Saturn RAM cartridge that would be slotted into the back of the Saturn, in addition to even testing out the game with the Saturn 3D analog pad that gave much more freedom and control to Sonic, but E3 1996 in May was coming quick, and all that they had to show so far were the bosses that she had completed by then. In an attempt to assist in importing levels from Ophir's engine to Coffin's engine, Chris Sen moved out of his apartment and put all his belongings in a Sega warehouse while moving directly into an old STI building next to the main one. This led to the Jade Gully level being ported over, now lacking the reflex lens as that was exclusive to over Alon's engine and not easy to replicate. And so two months in, the project was already in dire trouble with its slow progression. The new CEO of Sega of America, Bernie Stoller, was greatly concerned and met with the game's director Roger Hector and Mike Wallace in the idea of now removing all shackles that were restraining production. As a result, giving them all the resources they need for it to be done. This as a result led to the core team moving into STI's former office to work 15 to 16 hour shifts on the game while Sega fed and gave them sleeping arrangements in order to meet the game's deadline. But shifting to the other side of the world, Japanese team within Sega Japan made by Sega members of STI who had left after Sonic 3 and Knuckles and now led by Sonic's co-creator Yuji Naka were hard at work on a new game called Nights Into Dreams which was getting near its July 5th 1996 release date. Staff at STI had taken notice of the game and felt that if they could utilize this engine instead, they could actually complete the game by Christmas instead of having to create their own development tools. CEO Bernie Stoller took note of this and requested Sonic Team to share the engine code and editing tools of Nights into Dreams with STI. When Yuji Naka heard this, he was pissed. Naka was already one who wasn't fond of his former co-workers at STI to the point of even looking down on the demo build of Sonic Mars. And being very protective of his and his team's property, he specifically warned Sega that if STI uses any of Sonic Team's code, he will quit Sega. And so the team was forced to abide by Yuji Naka's request and stick to their own Project Condor engine. Eventually, E3 1996 rolled around, a major venue that Nintendo was utilizing at the time to show off the new Nintendo 64 and their killer app, Super Mario 64, in contrast to Sega, who had Sonic Extreme, a game upon reveal showcasing a trailer that parodied Mario being fearful of Sonic's new game while simultaneously showcasing its features. This was met with high praise and thunderous claps, being called Sega's answer to Super Mario Mario 64, now heating up the console wars with the much expected launch date of both games and holiday 1996. Due to how the main levels were not ready yet to be shown within Coffin's engine, old footage from Ophir Alon's engine were being used within the trailer, that still included the reflex lens. But what they had on the show floor was a boss level that they had completed, specifically that dummy green gem level, this simply being for the purpose of allowing people to play and feel out Sonic in 3D. But behind closed doors, there was an invite only event for gaming press. Here, they showed off a real boss battle against Metal Sonic, first look anyone had of it yet. But despite the love for it at the event, the game's hype quickly started to fizzle as media coverage was at an all time low, and in fact to make matters worse, it seems word had gone out about the visit by Sega of Japan's executive Shochiro Irimajiri to STI and his disappointment with the game. 
And so, with that now being public knowledge, gaming press started to turn on the unfortunate state of Sonic Extreme, even interviewing Yuji Naka on it, who spoke poorly about the project. Soon came Sega's Gamer Day, where they showed off Sonic Extreme once more, and this time with Jade Gully in playable form. This would mark the final time the public would see the game. Sega of America was at this point losing confidence with this game, and were even foregoing its inclusion within their home VHS tape that contained the sizzle of upcoming Saturn games. In fact, CEO Bernie Solar devised a backup plan for an enhanced Saturn port of the other pseudo 3D Sonic game called Sonic 3D Flicky's Island, in case Sonic Extreme falters, with much of the marketing going to that game now. Despite this, between June and August, designer Chris Sutton had been working hard from his makeshift home at the old STI building, at this point having 80% of the game's acts complete, with the last 20 still requiring a lot more prowess, overall growing ever closer to making a complete game. However, disaster struck in the form of illness. Christina Coffin, out of being so overworked, fell horrendously ill and had to start pulling back from the project. And nearly simultaneously in August, Chris Sen was hit with a case of life-threatening pneumonia. Even with this, Chris Sen refused to rest and kept working even though he was either vomiting or incapacitated. This nearly killed him. Eventually, he had to also drop out, having lost 25 pounds and was even told by a nurse that he only had 6 months to live. Thankfully, he survived. In shock, producer Mike Wallace, seeing two major members drop like this, informed management that this game will not meet the 1996 Christmas deadline. At first, STI was told that the project will simply get delayed, but everyone knew that in reality, Sonic Extreme, the game that technically had been worked on since Sonic Mars for nearly 2 years, was actually cancelled at this point after all the trouble and money spent. And soon all remaining ad money was spent by Sega to advertise Yuji Naka and Sonic Team's new game Nights Into Dreams as their big holiday game. In further irony, when Christina Coffin did return to work, she was now instead a developer technical assistant at Sega, whereby she had passed much of what she had learned on her Project Condor engine to the Sonic Team in Japan to use on their next game Burning Rangers. The death of Sonic Extreme was something that was felt and rippled throughout the entire company. The lack of a proper 3D Sonic platformer is largely credited for the Sega Saturn's absolute failure in the face of the Nintendo 64 and especially the new Sony PlayStation, something not even the other Saturn 3D Sonic games like Sonic R could fill. And the biggest loss in all this being the closure of Sega Technical Institute at the end of 1996. After being the very team that built nearly all the main Genesis Sonic games, the Legacy team was officially shut down after much of the mishaps that came about out of Sonic Extreme's development. Some still stayed at Sega as general employees, including programmer Ofra Allon and Chris Sen, who despite the cancellation of Sonic Extreme on console, kept working on the PC version privately into 1997, which still had all of its known traits, including the reflex lens and the world spinning. When they did finally pitch their build to SegaSoft, a division of Sega responsible for both PC and Saturn game development, the division's head Greg Sewers refused to fund the game, and only were comfortable with poor existing Saturn games to PC. After all that work, the level 60% complete, and the overall bad treatment he had received from management when they took him off the Saturn version, Ophrallon had had enough and left Sega. And with that, Sonic as a 3D platformer was truly dead. At least for the time being. Despite Yuji Naka separating and making Sonic Team as a means to make games that were not Sonic, he was being pressured back into it, which is where the team finally started to look into making this a reality. Starting off on the Sega Saturn, and even having some of its assets playable in the Sonic Jam collection in a segment called Sonic World, to eventually being made real once brought over to the Sega Dreamcast as Sonic Adventure. And thank you for watching! Hit the subscribe button for more Sonic and other games gaming history. Hit the like button and comment below on if Sonic Extreme would have appealed to you. So everyone, thank you for watching!